Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adeline, for, for being here today. Uh, so, um, Dr. Adeline Jones Putra is um, a professor of literature at the Jian Zhotong Liverpool University in China and former president for the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment in UK and Ireland. Uh, she will explain the rise of climate fiction, its major themes, and its possible role in helping us understand and deal with climate change. She will particularly focus on climate fiction's concern with how climate change will impact future generations. So let's uh, give uh, Dr. John Sputra a warm welcome and a silent clap. Thank you for being here today. Right. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a real privilege, really, to speak to all of you and um, to be part of this initiative. Um, it's exciting, really, to be speaking to a range of undergraduate and postgraduate students from, you know, drawn from, you know, two countries and I imagine various disciplines, uh, rather than, you know, sometimes the echo chamber of my fellow academics in my field. So this is really um, um, a really exciting um, venture for me. Could I just check, because we're using Zoom, um, that you will be able to see me as well as my slides once um, once um, my screen is shared. Yes, um, absolutely, but um, so your window will be minimized in the, in the corner. Brilliant, excellent. Okay, um, well then, um, I just uh, what's left before I start is to say thank you to uh, Nicole and to all of the um, UK and JP student conference organizers. Okay, I think I'll, let's see if I, um, yes. I just have to be sure that I have my screen shared and we're back to my screen. Uh, is it seems to have gone um, my slides. So I'll have to make sure I've got them again. Um, all right, okay. Right. Okay. Can I have a yep, big nod, nods and thumbs up. Brilliant. Okay. So you can hear me and I'm assuming you can see my slides. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, oh you know, I presume you'll, you'll uh, unmute and shout at me if you can't. Okay. Here we are. So. Yeah, that's how we've realized. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's, um, let's start with, um, with an introduction, not just to climate fiction, but of course to the theme of your conference, and that is um, climate change. Okay. Now, I'm sure you've already heard from um, the uh, expert, uh, Dan, that you had yesterday, um, and you've been talking about this already, that climate change has been called a wicked problem. Indeed, it's been called a super wicked problem. Uh, because it's a complex multidimensional problem um, and that because any solution uh, will have to be just as complex. So there's no doubt that the climate crisis is one of the most pressing crises facing us today. And when I say us, I mean um, not just humankind, I mean every species, human and non-human, I mean animal, plant, microbe, um, sentient or non-sentient, every living thing on this planet is being affected. The fact that I can say that this is such a pressing crisis, uh, while we're sitting here in the midst of another pressingly wicked problem, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think really puts that into perspective. In 2018, the WHO estimated that between 2030 and 2050, um, climate change will cause 250,000 human deaths a year. That's human deaths. So if you think of that as just 20 years, that's 5 million deaths. It's over six times the number of COVID-19 deaths we have up till now. So I'm not comparing these figures, I really want to be clear. I'm not comparing these figures so, you know, we can have some kind of grim crisis contest. That, that's not the point. I'm just saying it to remind all of us that 
that we, even if we sit right here in the midst of the, 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 this existential challenge, um, that's the, the pandemic, we can't lose sight of the other um, climate crisis in the background, uh, which is a challenge to the existence of the other living things with, with which we share this planet. But I'm not trying to say that from a position of hopelessness. Um, even though it's a position that's grim and difficult and painful. I want to talk to you today um, about the stories we're telling about the climate crisis, the ways in which we're representing it, the ways in which we're working through our concerns about it, and the ways in which we're thinking and rethinking how, how we could reach out to each other um, as we grapple with climate crisis. Um, and I'd like to talk to you then about the, this increasingly popular literary form that is climate fiction. I'll discuss its rise and then I'll discuss the frames and the strategies um, that are used in climate novels to represent climate change. And well, I believe, and I'm doing this because I believe that these can teach us uh, something about how to communicate about climate change. It's not everything, but it's something. It's a piece of the puzzle. And at the end of, towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll focus especially on how climate fiction represents and engages with future generations and what that could mean for you. So, well, what's climate fiction? I'm simply going to start, I, I mean, I could go on about this for an hour itself, but I'm really going to start with a very basic definition, okay? Climate fiction is a category of fiction um, that you know, deals in some way with anthropogenic climate change, okay? Um, you know, in terms of plot or setting or character or a combination of these, okay? And the best way to understand climate change as a literary category is to understand how it came about. So I'm going to talk about um, the rise of climate fiction, but in order to do that, I'll have to really um, talk about a bit of context and really talk about the rise of climate change awareness, okay? Um, you may have heard some of this already and you may be aware of some of this, um, but very quickly we, we can say that Certainly, the, the seeds of this awareness lie in the early 19th century. Um, it was then in, in you know, the 1820s that the warming effect of increased carbon dioxide and other um, gases in the atmosphere was first identified. Um, it was first described, um, not necessarily called the greenhouse effect that came later, but it was first described by um, the French scientist Joseph Fourier. Um, and then Fourier's theory was proven um, with experiments, by experiments by John Tyndall, um, the Irish scientist, and uh, Svante Arrhenius um, uh, in the second half of the 19th century. But we shouldn't forget, and it's quite interesting, I found this, this picture of these three great men of climate change um, discovery. And, um, we shouldn't forget the contribution of um, the American scientist Eunice Newton Foote. And I do want to remind um, those who've heard of her and introduce her to those who haven't, that she measured before Tyndall and Arrhenius the relationship between greenhouse gases and the sun's heat, you know, and, and um, how this would create a kind of increasingly warming effect. Um, but she was never cited by Tyndall, even though her experiments took place before his. But if we want to think about the actual discovery of climate change as we know it, then that comes in the 1960s and 70s uh, into the 20th century. And the background to this, uh, and you're again possibly aware of this, the background to this, of course, you have to remember is um, the great leap in, climate, uh, in, in environmental awareness that happened in the um, middle of the uh, 20th century and into the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, this kind of global environmental awareness that we think of now as environmentalism, eco-activism, tree hugging, um, you know, being a green warrior, all of that really arose in earnest in the 60s and 70s. Um, the, um, the first Earth Day 
happened uh, in 1970 uh, in the US. And that was the New York Times reporting that in 1970, in April. Um, Friends of the Earth, a key uh, environmental charity, was, was founded in 1969. Greenpeace um, was founded, um, and in fact, nobody quite knows who founded it. There were so many people involved, it was such a collective. It started in, 19, in 1971. Okay. But as far as the, um, the smaller picture, if you like, you know, the, the specific issue of climate change awareness is concerned amidst this background of environmental awareness of the 1960s and 70s. As far as that's concerned, um, we have to thank a, a, a range of scientists, um, Charles Keeling, Roger Revell, Wally Brooker, Reed Bryson, Stephen Schneider, whose book you see up there in the corner if, um, of, of the slide. Um, they were speaking at forums such as the World Climate Conference in Geneva in uh, 1979. You can see um, there's the, those are the proceedings there on the, on the slide. And they brought the, the problem of the greenhouse effect and what they were beginning to call global warming um, to the public as well as to governments and policymakers. And, um, you know, actually writing some popular books like Stephen Schneider's Genesis Strategy. At this point, if we then turn having thought some, somewhat about the context here of climate change awareness, if we turn to um, climate fiction, we can see that some authors are beginning to engage with climate science um, and its revelations of human-made uh, global warming or what we now call anthropogenic climate change. Beforehand, I just want to draw your attention to, to, to a, a few, if you like, pre-climate fiction um, texts, and um, they weren't dealing necessarily with what we think of as anthropogenic climate change. They were dealing with widespread global, that is, um, climate, climatic changes, um, not necessarily caused by greenhouse gases. And these two key texts are rather fittingly for a UK-Japan conference um, by the British author, um, the drowned uh, J.G. Ballard, The Drowned World of 1962, and by the Japanese uh, science fiction writer uh, Kobe Abe, um, who's, um, let me get this right, Daiyon uh, Kampioki, <laughs> excuse my Japanese, which kind of translates into Inter Ice Age 4 or kind of interglacial, the fourth interglacial. And it's about melting ice caps. But these aren't really dealing with what the scientists were talking about, this emerging effect of greenhouse uh, gases causing uh, um, global heating. Uh, it takes till uh, about 1971 when that wonderful pioneer of science fiction, Ursula K. Le Guin, writes The Lathe of Heaven. Now, this is actually quite a complex plot for a short novel. But the catastrophe, the kind of breakdown and collapse that marks the start of the novel is caused by global warming as we understand it. And then in 1977, um, a minor author, Arthur Herzog, writes a novel called Heat, which is entirely about global warming, what he calls runaway greenhouse. Okay. Um, then in 1987, uh, a really brilliant early cl uh, climate fiction text, The Sea and Summer, is written by the Australian novelist uh, George Turner, who, is, who was up till then better known as a realist, if you like, a kind of quite serious realist writer, author, but he turned to science fiction to write um, The Sea and Summer about sea level rise uh, in his city of Melbourne, Australia. So in the, if we move really from the 60s and 70s into the 1980s, because here's where climate change awareness really begins to get interesting. Um, it gets an increasingly high profile. Um, the um, United Nations Environmental uh, Pro Program and the World Meteor Meteorological Association set up a climate advisory group in 1985. And that's the very beginning of um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change created under the auspices of the United Nations in 1988. Okay, that's source really of so much comprehensive 
climate data, climate change data right now. But a really important um, um, event, just because of its dramatic um, effect on the public, was the invitation to James Hansen, the climate scientist at NASA, um, to speak at the US Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources in 1988, also uh, the same year the IPCC is created. Um, now, this, this really dramatic testimony took place in the middle of a sweltering summer, okay? Perhaps not climate change caused. Um, Washington, as you know, possibly know, goes through terribly hot summers and the US was going through a heat wave. And, you know, he speaks to the, this Senate committee um, um, on the 23rd of June, 1988. And it, his very, very drastic warnings um, were widely reported. They weren't necessarily widely believed because the then Bush administration, George H.W. Bush, was very skeptical, as we know, and that skepticism came up again with, um, with the later Bush, um, his son, George W. Bush. But definitely, um, it pierced the public consciousness. Here's the beginning, really, if you like, of all those big time cover uh, reports of, of global warming. Um, into the 1990s, very quickly, um, the IPCC makes its first report and it, gets, it makes several key reports, uh, kind of inter, um, inter-seasonal report in 1992, because at that time too, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, was introduced, open for signing at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And then in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol um, was signed whatever its failures now through so many earth summits and climate change conferences, whatever we may think, it was a key moment when um, many um, countries across the globe began to sign up to cutting carbon emissions relative to their, their uh, economy size. Okay, so that was really, you know, the 90s really um, stuff began to happen. But um, let's fast forward to this. If you think back to James Hansen, um, some of you may know that the young senator in the 80s who was instrumental in inviting him to speak, um, in, not just in 1988, but two years earlier in 1986, and who was um, leading, chairing many of these committee meetings, these hearings, was of course Al Gore Jr. And we all know the role that Al Gore played um, in increasing climate change awareness and consciousness. Um, into the 21st century, when he um, narrowly lost the presidential election, um, he turned really to um, turning his climate change concerns and activism into a roadshow. Uh, he went round, um, first the country and now the world, talking to people about climate change, and that was all captured on film, turned into a documentary uh, called an inconvenient truth, which um, anybody interested in climate change would have seen. It released in 2006. In 2007, El Gore, the IPCC, win the Nobel Peace Prize. So, so far, so positive, right? But um, it's not entirely positive as we know. Um, and things are about to get a lot, well, literally and figuratively a lot hotter. Against this background, though, of activism through the 1990s and 2000s, um, we do see paralleling this, you know, kind of interest, we do see a real turn to climate change um, for the first time. We see um, prominent authors like Maggie G writing The Ice People in 1998, T.C. Boyle. If G is a, is a prominent UK author, um, you know, she's become much more well known in, in the past few years. Then T.C. Boyle is, is of her, of, of comparative acclaim and fame in the US, and he's writing A Friend of the Earth in 2000. And then the much accoladed science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson writes um, a trilogy, a climate change trilogy. Um, he, he moves back, if you like, from, you know, hard science fiction to a um, uh, kind of present day or near future set climate changing world in this trilogy that's um, been nicknamed the science 
in the Capital Trilogy, uh, released one after the other, his books 2004, 2005, 2007. And also in 2007, um, you know, recognizing this emerging ph phenomenon, um, uh, a Taiwan-based journalist called Dan Bloom um, coins the phrase cli-fi to, if you like, give people a hook, you know, by which to start talking about and understanding this phenomenon of climate fiction. And in 2009, I began to study climate fiction in earnest. So I've been looking at it now for about over half my career. And my research assistant, my then research assistant, Adam Trexler and I, uh, at that point looked, uh, scoured really the book industry all over the world and found about 150 examples of climate fiction in 2009, okay? Um, not very m many if you think about the size of the global book industry. But in the, in the 2010s, if you like, um, as I said, things got hotter, certainly got hotter in several ways. Um, climate consciousness has escalated, climate change has escalated. Freak seasonal, I mean, no, freak seasonal or unseasonal weather, if you think about it, is now unavoidable. We're experiencing sweltering summers or freezing winters. Then we experience freezing summers and mild winters. There are wild weather events that are beginning to um, become too innumerable to count, it would seem. Extreme droughts, record-breaking hurricane seasons and typhoon seasons. Um, so a second cluster of novels appears after 2010. Um, some really, you know, I've spoken about prominent novels before, uh, novelists before, but um, these names that emerge um, beginning to grapple with climate crisis are some of the top names in, in, um, in mainstream uh, fiction. Um, Ian McEwan, the British novelist, writes Solar. Um, uh, Barbara Kinsolver, American novelist, writes Flight Behavior. David Mitchell, I'm sure you've all heard of his work. The Bone Clocks, um, 2014, is about climate change. And the um, Indian-born American writer, Amitav Ghosh, writes Gun Island very recently. And, um, you know, through uh, the later half, if you like, of this last decade, um, there have been novels written from around the world. So uh, although I, tend to focus on anglophone literature you know there are novels from finland to australia okay um and these you could speculate really about how especially countries like finland and australia with extreme climates um have yielded very very um active uh, climate fiction industries okay parantaya or the healer by uh antitum in uh Tuomainen is what I have there, 2011. Emi Itavanta, Memory of Water uh, from 2014. Uh, Elena Hirvonen's When Time Runs Out is there, 2017, that Finnish authors. And then the Australian, indigenous Australian writer, Alexis Wright, has one book of 2013. And very recently, the author James Clade, Australian also, um, has been writing um, several novels about climate change, the most prominent being Clade. Okay, so really, as I say, perhaps tongue in cheek on the slide, you can think about not just runaway climate change, but perhaps the more positive phenomenon of, clim of runaway climate fiction. I, you know, I've stopped counting. Um, I had the good fortune of speaking to Kim Stanley Robinson, the science fiction um, author at a conference about eight years ago, and he described trying to get his trilogy published in um, in 2004, um, and his publisher not wanting to know about climate change, saying, stop it, Stan, as he, as he calls himself, stop it, I don't want to know, you're, you know, you're, you're doing hard science fiction, that's what people want to read, climate change is marginal, and that's in the mid-2000s, um, the mid-noughties. And then, uh, and he, as he put it, because he was so successful as a science fiction writer, he said to his publisher, I'm cashing in my chips, you know, you're gonna do this for me. And they did. 
about 2010-11, um, the Financial Times does a piece on climate fiction. They, I, I was interviewed for it and um, their environmental correspondent said, we're hearing about climate fiction, but when I talk to publishers, nobody wants to know. Um, you know, is this happening or not? And it would seem that what was going on was authors were pushing to write about it and publishers were initially skeptical because it was a niche um, issue as some politicians would still say. But no, into the 2010s, here's where we are. You, you can't keep track of how um, popular the trend is. Um, if you do want to look at, at some uh, thoughts on it, uh, on so-called CliFi, Dan Bloom's um, climate fiction website, CliFi.net is still running and is quite an entertaining read and he's quite an activist for it. Okay, so I've talked a lot about the rise of climate fiction. Um, let me think now about, about representing climate fiction. I was going, as I've said, I, I, I want to talk about the, the challenges of representing climate, climate change and the strategies that are developed to do that. Let's talk first about the challenges. No, well, let's, let's go back a bit. Okay, the popularity of climate fiction would um, suggest that everybody's writing about it. Well, a lot of people are. And this belies the fact actually that it's, it can be quite hard to write imaginatively about climate change. There are some very specific challenges. The things that make climate change a wicked problem, as I began by saying, that is this problem that's not immediately solvable because it's multidimensional. Those things also make it a kind of representational or narrative challenge. It's a challenge, climate change, to our conventional ways of thinking about ourselves and so to our ways of communicating and telling stories about ourselves. It's a challenge to our habit of framing um, our stories, by which I mean our problems, our, our priorities, our dreams, our ambitions, our hopes. Um, this long-term habit we've had of framing all of these in human terms, human lifetimes, human lives in which human-to-human -human interactions occur, uh, within human communities uh, or families or neighborhoods, cities, countries. And even, you know, even the number of people with whom you, you communicate and um, engage um, with, with a vast network, on a vast network like Instagram or Twitter, really um, at any one point you're only limited to whomever is responding to that post on that thread, okay? But the scales, the Scales of climate change are way, way off um, the human scale, right? Let's talk about scale first then in terms of challenges. Let's think about the vast time scale of climate change. It's an environmental catastrophe without precedent in human history. And that's not only thinking about um, the incredibly long lasting effect of climate change itself. Some of these effects are actually irreversible, not just long lasting. Species extinction, biodiversity, um, depletion and loss. And those are happening now. There are some effects of climate change, uh, which you would have probably heard about yesterday, that um, will take thousands of years just to emerge. So it'll take that long just for us to see the effects, let alone then what those do, okay? And those are things that are so-called millennial time scale events, ocean um, oxygen depletion, ocean anoxia, um, disruptions to the ocean uh, thermohaline circulation, right? The kind of global ocean currents. Um, some of these are being disrupted now, but some of them, we are not sure how much we're doing to the atmosphere that, um, you know, it's only really in thousands of years that this is going to become clear. So, you know, we'd have to go back to the last ice age or the last glacial period, um, which ended about 
12,000, well, 11,700 years ago. Um, you know, when our current geological epoch, right, the Holocene, um, when that ended, uh, when, sorry, when that started, we would have to go back to the end of the last ice age um, to see global environmental change of such enormity. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, thinking about glaciation and geological epochs, well, that suggests that, you know, this is all part of a pattern. Well, that's when you see huge change, but now you're seeing huge change caused by humans. Okay. The extent of the greenhouse effect caused by climate change will impact the normal pattern of glaciation that the Earth's been seeing for millions of years. And that's another way of saying that climate change could be impacting, um, sorry, uh, the impacts of climate change are so great that they are being considered by some geologists to have such effects on, on the systems and processes and species of this planet that they will leave a rec record of human activity in the geological strata of the earth. And it will warrant the naming of a new geological epoch, something you've probably all heard of, the Anthropocene. Okay. Um, so we're disrupting geological epochs and glaciation to such an extent. Um, and our activity is so great that you're actually going to find geologists, some geologists think that golden spike in the fossil record when you can see when our activity started to hit. Okay. And that's what we're talking about when we wonder if this Holocene that we're in really should be called the Anthropocene. So climate change challenges our sense that meaningful things only happen on human timelines. The climate crisis is meaningful, but it's happening on a geological timeline. And geological timelines, well, as I've already been saying, we're talking of millions of years. These are vast. Now, let's move to another challenge in representing climate change. The scale issue is, is representationally difficult because it's mind blowing. There's another issue when it comes to talking about climate change and telling stories about it. And that is, and you may already, you might be sympathetic to this if your eyes are glazing over somewhat at all the scientific detail. If you're not someone who's working in science, studying science um, and, and with a particular interest in it, fair enough. Um, well, then um, you're coming across this other challenge to telling stories about climate change. Okay. As I said, our stories are usually about our problems, our, our priorities, our dreams, ambitions, hopes. They're speaking to our emotions. Okay. But as I say on the slide, to understand the true ex extent of climate change, you have to understand some of the scientific evidence behind it. Um, that's how we know it's happening. Um, and for this, we use our faculties of reason and logic. Science, as I say, appeals to reason. That's what my arrow is trying to say on the slide. Stories, however, appeal to emotion, okay? And so stories about climate change somehow have to engage both, talk about our hopes and ambitions and dreams while um, actually um, getting us to understand the scientific reasons for those threats to those hopes and ambitions and dreams. And they've got to remain scientifically accurate. Every good novelist needs to do research to keep the novels realistic or accurate. And that doesn't just apply to climate fiction writers. And so finally, and this is the killer point in terms of grappling with climate change. We need to tell stories about climate change. We can't shirk the responsibility, despite the challenges of representing and narrating it. Because although it's happening on a timescale beyond our imagining, it's being caused by us. Small actions happening in really these relatively tiny human lifetimes are actually affecting the planet. Every nook and cranny, all of its living things, over hundreds of thousands of years. Let's think a little bit about hope here in representing climate change at least, okay? There are ways to tell these stories and to get us all readers uh, to engage. And in telling these stories um, and finding and talking about these strategies, 
extrapolate to how you communicate about climate change generally. Okay. Um, I've said that it's a challenge to our imaginative capabilities and thus to our modes of representing and narrating, but I've also said there's lots of it going on. Lots of climate change fiction, climate fiction being written. So what solutions um, can we find in these, um, what strategies can we find in these novels for representing climate change? and getting people to think about it. Let me, before I consider any of these, I'm going to say a few words about um, the effects of fiction, more generally speaking, okay, because that will impact what I try to say about um, what climate fiction does. Um, th there are two aspects of fictional narrative and the way in which they appeal uh, to us or draw to talk to you about, um, you know, two technical terms that, that are worth um, understanding or, or you know um, concepts that are worth understanding and these have to do with what uh, a literary scholar of quite a few years ago some uh, uh, a scholar called Wayne Booth um, wrote about in, in 1988 um, um, he talked about the ethics of fiction okay. Booth described the two experiences that people have when they read fiction um, and one he called the aesthetic effect, and one he called the efferent effect. Okay. The aesthetic effect is what happens um, with, in one of those pictures that you see on the slide when the reader is reading and hopefully enjoying the text. And the aesthetic effect has to do with, um, you know, um, enjoying the, um, the, the way that, in which the imaginative world is built and the way in which the characters are described, the details, the ideas that come out, maybe some mysteries, bits of suspense, exciting, attractive characters. Then the efferent effect, and efferent means to carry, to conduct, to do with freight, okay? The efferent effect is what happens when the text is put down. And I've got a picture there of a, of a reader having put the text down, looking off into the distance and thinking. It has to do with the psychological or intellectual meaning or message or moral that remains. And it usually takes place in the reader's mind along with a comparison or a calibration of what has been read against his or her own experiences, their own experiences, and their other readings. Okay. Um, this is what Booth theorized, something that is more or less repeated in quite a, a, a lot of reception theory or reader response theory in literary studies. It has to do with this efferent effect. It has to do with our identification and empathy with characters. How do I feel with them? How, how do I feel about them? How do I travel alongside them? And also how real, how believable is the world that I'm in? This doesn't have to be realistic in the kind of historical fiction sense. Even fantasies, fantasy novels um, need to be believable in as much as they need to be internally coherent. So, on the one hand, in order for the efferent effect to take hold, for the aesthetic effect of reading to turn into an efferent effect that you, of, you know, something you hope keep with you and affects the way you think and perhaps even act, empathy, how you feel about characters, and what we would call very similitude, the believability, the veracity of a text, um, its internal coherence or realism, these two are key. Okay, so I just want to, these are terms that I will come back to as I talk about climate fiction, okay? So how do we get readers to empathize with characters and engage with the setting, the worlds in which characters live and, and so on, while addressing these vast scales of climate change and also ensuring that the scientific reality of climate change is adequately represented and understood? Remember, I talked about scale and size. So that's a challenge, okay? Let's take a look at um, what climate fiction does. Okay, um, could I redefine? Okay, verisimilitude. Okay, um, someone's asking that I redefine verisimilitude. Yeah, that's fine. Verisimilitude is the believability, refers to the be believability of a text um, and the world that it builds, okay? Um, so there are two things, empathy, how much you feel and identify with characters, as well as 
very similar to it, how believable the world in which they travel is. And these two contribute to this efferent effect, which is the extent to which you hold on to uh, what's going on in the text in your mind and compare it with your other experiences once you have put the text down. Okay? But I'm happy to take more questions and uh, redefine things uh, in Q&A as well. Okay. So let's think about what's going on in some climate fiction. Now, a great many um, climate fiction novels, first of all, are set in the future. Okay. They are um, set in climate ravaged futures, usually what we would call post-apocalyptic or dystopian. Um, now, the difference between these two terms, and these are probably terms you've heard of even in common parlance, um, the difference between them really has to do with the extent or the, emphas or, or, or the emphasis on the apocalyptic event that causes this future world to be like this. And so we're talking about post-apocalyptic narratives, particularly when they suggest that a single event has destroyed the world and they focus really on the shock and rupture caused by that event. So the, the picture at the bottom, you know, of a kind of um, really ravaged world where people are, you know, picking through the rubble as it were, um, um, and dealing with that shock. That tends to be called post-apocalyptic. Dystopian narratives usually just a slightly slower collapse. And, um, and I've got a picture up there of a kind of Blade Runner um, vision of a more stable society, but really one that's undergone some kind of very slow but thorough collapse as well, okay? But rebuilt um, and picked up some of the pieces, um, but it's all terribly ravaged and catastrophic and pretty nasty, hence the word dystopian as opposed to utopian, okay? Now, um, this, the, these futuristic worlds, of course, are version of the world that we are creating in climate fiction, when, when these futuristic worlds are set out in climate fiction. They're a reminder or a warning of how long lasting our actions can be. And um, because they're futuristic texts, they operate in much the same way, these climate fictions, futuristic narratives, they operate in the way that a lot of science fiction operates, which is that um, they try to be scientifically accurate in the way they present these future worlds. Okay. Um, and examples of this, I won't, you're not necessarily having, you know, you're not experts who've read these, so I'm just going to put these up there and perhaps hopefully inspire some of you to read some of these. Um, examples of um, some very scientifically accurate novels. Um, a good example is Kim Stanley Robinson. We go back to him and his very recent novel, New York 2140. It's quite an, you know, it's a very, particular um, um, a point in time that he's talking about and imagining what it would look like if sea levels had risen up to, you know, drowning Manhattan, as you can see in the picture. And then you get these slightly more fanciful projections into far distant futures. They're really much more focused, if not on the scientific accuracy, they're focused on that kind of emotional or psychological reaction in the reader. And that's something like Paolo Bacigalupi's the wind-up girl set in a far, far distant um, Thailand, set in a, an unrecognizable Bangkok. Okay. But not all climate fiction is set in the future. Some are set in the present and are detailing what's happening now and making it clear really that climate change is a problem for the present as well and that it requires action in the present. And these present day um, narratives present day settings emphasize um, the kind of emotional and psychological and even political or economic difficulty in addressing climate change now and this need to find solutions now. So in the future, they're showing us this small slice of climate change in the here and now, and it's usually a small slice. A single climate change location in the present becomes an analogy, a microcosm, if you like, for the larger climate change planet, the macrocosm, the climate changed planet of the future. 
A good example of this, and again, I'm, I'm going back to Kim Stanley Robinson because he's been such a pioneer in climate fiction. Um, his Science in the Capital trilogy I spoke about imagines a world only a few years in the future. Okay, and he imagines dramatically abrupt climate change, changing the planet just like that. Okay. That allows him to, um, you know, on the premise of this sudden tipping point, um, to portray a small group of scientists, policy makers, politicians coming to fix climate change. It's very positive as novel skill. Okay. Um, Another example of a present day setting and a consideration of what to do now is Barbara Kingsolver's flight behavior of 2012. Now this is describes, this novel describes a very distinctive climate change impact that happens right in the present in the backyard of her female protagonist, her central character. That character is a young woman living in Tennessee Okay, rural Tennessee, very poor, impoverished. And she realizes one day as she walks out, looks out to the property behind her house, that it's completely covered with monarch butterflies. And, you know, how, what does this have to do with climate change? Well, the place is completely covered. Trees are just um, carpeted with millions and millions of these beautiful butterflies because they're hibernating. Um, I've got a picture there of what monarch butterflies look like when they go into hibernate and rest on trees. They're hibernating because their normal migratory route, which would take them, and I've got a map there to show you, it, the route starts um, in the northern United States and, the, and Canada, and these butterflies fly all the way down to Mexico to hibernate, um, and then they go back, okay, in order to uh, be overwinter, you know, uh, mate, reproduce, and so on. And this is disrupted by climate change. Landslides in Mexico mean their habitat in Mexico is gone. They come to Tennessee instead, these beautiful butterflies. So this one event becomes, um, if you like, um, you know, uh, a signifier for the impacts of climate change, and it's brought literally to this woman's doorstep. And this dramatic impact of what climate change could do on the future is underlined to her, is brought to, not just to her doorstep, but to her realization. When scientists visit the site and they tell her that the butterflies, um, if they overwinter in Tennessee, they will be in danger um, of what the Tennessee winter will be like as opposed to Mexico, and they could die, and that would be the end of the species. So it's a very powerful story of this one moment in time, this one event actually representing so many climate change impacts and what could happen in the future and the, and the irreversibility of species loss. Okay. Now, just very quickly, it's worth saying that okay, present day settings like this, like Robinson's uh, trilogy and like King Solver's flight behavior, um, don't just do the two things that I've already spoken about, which is talk about climate change as a problem for the present and use a single climate change location or event as an analogy for what happens in the future, they do this really clever thing which is use the scientist as hero, okay? Um, they introduce the scientist as a character and that allows them, um, you know, to, to produce empathy with the scientist. And if you think about it really, the scientist as hero is a phenomenon, is a stereotype of the late 20th century into the 21st, um, you know, alongside ideas of mad scientists, and explorer scientists. The mid 20th century to late to now in the 21st, we've become fascinated by scientist heroes. Um, I've got a few of them up here for you. Okay, we've gone from Frankenstein in the upper left corner to, you know, like Jules Verne's, you know, Captain Nemo in the middle there, to these heroic scientists who can help save the world. And they've become a type that's also seen in climate fiction. You know, I've got Will Smith's character and I'm legend and Indiana Jones, of course archaeologist um, with, you know, scientific leanings and uh, my favorite character, Dana Scully from um, the early X-Files series, okay? So really, if we think about, um, you know, these strategies, 
of representing climate change. Let's return to the challenges that I discussed, um, these challenges in representing climate change in fiction and see how these future and present day settings perform in terms of offering us strategies. Let's see it in a bit more detail, okay? Um, we talked about scale, particularly the vast time scales of climate change, remember? And um, this is something having lost and damaging impact for thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of years. Remember also that I suggested that the scientific evidence for climate change, climate science, is something that imaginative texts try to use uh, as a basis, but um, you know they have to make that hard scientific data um, is these emotionally pertinent stories. And finally, uh, let's recall the African effect and how we have to identify and feel empathy. We also have to believe in the world about which we're reading a similitude um, for the African effect to take hold. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to ensuring that um, settings are accurate and believable in terms of science, well, if you look at my Got, I've got these two sections slightly, I've got scale above science, but I'd like you to look at the science bullet point first. Um, but it, to ensuring that settings are accurate, believable in terms of science, well, future settings operating like science fiction, as I said, hardwire the science into the setting. Okay. And then the um, many present day texts and indeed many climate fiction texts in general include these believable empathetic scientist characters and they introduce this not in terms of setting but in terms of dialogue or interior monologue you know the characters thoughts and so they avoid what we call info dumping right just here's all the science they get relayed to us by these warm characters um, if you scale well when it comes to addressing the vast scale of, of climate change Futuristic climate fiction, the future settings, place us in these situations and alongside characters with whom um, we care. And present day settings work a bit harder to imagine and construct a, a disaster that represents what could happen more frequently in the future. Okay? They realistically construct the disaster affecting these characters for whom we can care. That's not all though. And this is what I want to end on. This is the final part of this talk. That's not all. There's one further way, and that's in the middle of your screen there. After I talk about scale and future settings, placing in situations, and present day settings, constructing faster, there's one further way in which climate depicts the future impacts of climate change as something about, what, about which we should care deeply and something that even if it's not believable, is something we cannot risk not believing. One of the most effective tools in the arsenal of climate fiction is its appeal to intergenerational concerns. And that's what I'm going to move into in this final part. This is actually a theme you will see right the way back, right, right the way through all kinds of climate change communication. So I'll just step back and, and consider some other media and talked about Al Gore before. Now towards the end of that groundbreaking film, in independent, uh, in con truth, sorry. Gore looks at the audience and he asks this question. He says, future generations may well have occasion to ask themselves, what were our parents thinking? Why didn't they wake up when they had the chance? We have to hear that question from them now. When the scientist James Hansen um, writes his book, finally, moving all his expertise into a single book called Storms of My Grandchildren, he makes very clear by inserting photographs of his grandchildren that he's doing it to try to save the world to some extent. For them. I didn't want my grandchildren to look back and say, Opa understood, but he didn't make it clear. All of these, um, you know, um, efforts, these rhetorical moments, are trying to remind us of this direct causal line between our actions now and the impacts they'll have later. They're enacting what I um, sometimes call, yeah, okay, posterity as parenthood, as you see on that slide, okay. 
And that's the idea really where the, the parent-child metaphor um, becomes, a, it is, well, the parent-child relationship, sorry, becomes a metaphor for um, the relationship of, of obligation between present humans and those in the future. Okay, so the common ground of that metaphor, um, the vehicle, as we call it, is parent, the tenor is our obligation to the future, the common ground is a kind of unconditional concern and responsibility. The same kind of unconditional concern that marks parents' attitudes to their children. It's an analogy, it's a metaphor, but it's one with a very powerful message. Climate fiction makes full use of this metaphor. Parent-child relationships abound. They, they are a recurring trope. They happen over and over again. Trope by a recurring trope, I mean a recurring symbol or a motif happening over and over again in climate novels. All the novels I list here find a way to talk about it. Gold Flame Citrus, um, Memory of Water, Negiji, all place their characters in the future in these dilemmas of parental responsibility um, for children as the world is falling apart. So that we have to think about what it means really to worry about children and why we didn't worry about them earlier. Flight behavior, um, that female, impoverished female um, protagonist um, learns from scientists about what's going on and she worries about her children and their future and she herself turns to science education and roles in college to help her children. More recently James Bradley's clay actually doesn't just rely on gen future genes to represent our children, he makes it very obvious because the novel traces one family's experiences, generations of one family, through an increasingly climate ravaged, climate change ravaged world. So I realize it looks like I have a few more slides, but actually not very many. Okay, I'm going to wrap. I'm going to say though, that it's possible that really we can do more with the posterity as our parenthood concept. Okay, and here's where if you like, I'm really handing it over to you and the workshop that you will do in thinking about climate activism. Okay be done with the posterity as parenthood uh, metaphor and it's people like you who can do it but all the power you attached to it there are some drawbacks first of all it's one-sided it puts all the responsibility for action on the side of parental figure the generations of here and now usually the older generation uh, as represented in the novel okay okay to some extent that's fine my generation's made this mess and we should take some responsibility. But the problem with responsibility is it also assigns power to determine what will work and what wouldn't. Okay? And this is the problem of paternalism. It doesn't just mean being paternal, paternalism. It means uh, someone in authority pretending to act in another's best interest, but actually holding on to their interest. Okay? But this generation, your generation and future generations need us and you to be thinking about what will truly work for you. And that requires no longer going about business as usual, the way we have, no longer thinking about perhaps simple sustainability. That well-known definition of sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's all about unchecked development and growth. Maybe we need to find other models that will work for your generation and generations after and work from your perspective. And maybe because it's time to listen to what so-called children have to say rather than the parents of these narratives, maybe that's why the voice of Greta Thunberg is so powerful. And it's certainly why climate change narratives could be talking about the future not just incorporating the perspectives of now, but the perspectives of those representation, representatives of future. Now also climate change, as I've already been saying, doesn't just affect one patch of the planet, it affects the entire planet. 
thinking only in terms of our children narrows the vision, restricts it to what's happening around us, rather than the stories of the very different experiences of effects on individuals and societies around the planet now and in the future when it comes to climate change. Okay, this is what some political philosophers who talk about parental ethics, parental care ethics, describe as the problem of parochialism, alongside the problem of paternalism, okay, only looking after your own. You could argue that this dilemma faced in climate fiction could be treated as an analogy for all the dilemmas faced around the world. You know, when we talk about a narrow one event in climate fiction, maybe it represents everything. But actually, the focus on a single location risks putting aside or discounting the very different responsibilities of communities around the world. Just consider the global disparity in carbon footprints or uh, CO2 emissions. So it's a good thing, really, that the climate strike, for example, is a global phenomenon. There's Berlin, there's Indonesia in these pictures. It's a collective of young people bringing their own experience to the movement. And it's a powerful idea that would be worth emulating in the stories we tell about climate change. Um, how do we make sure we're telling stories that allow empathy with and immersion within the many lives around the world? Now, finally, as I've also been saying, climate change affects not just human species, but non-human. This is an anthropocentric version. This problem with, with posterity as parenthood is an anthropocentric version of parochialism. Okay. As important and, effective, and as effective as all these messages about future generations are, they often ignore the fact that we're talking about future generations of humans. We have to remember the future generations of non-humans. Um, I confess that actually there are very few climate fiction texts that really remember the non-human species and their ecosystems. And Barbara Kingsall was not human. How do we tell more stories like this? The wonder of the butterflies, the tragedy of their extinction. How will you, as heralds of a future generation, help to remind us to share the planet for the future of all? We can't always save every organism, and simply focusing on individual animals um, can be problematic, but we can focus on allowing entire ecosystems to flourish. Saying all of this, not in an attitude of cutting off the responsibility, cleaning the mess up, as it were, onto you. Okay. Saying this in the spirit of intergenerational cooperation, if you like. From one generation, the one that made such a mess, to another. I've told you what I know. After half a year of studying the issue, about the challenges and the strategies that we've adopted to tell the stories of climate change, about the ways in which stories can move us, make us care, make us believe. So I'm inviting you, in a kind of spirit of hope, I think, um, as you all consider activist solutions and projects to address climate change, I'm inviting you to use these ideas that I've talked about. Bring your own to the table. Tell new stories about climate change. Inject empathy and believability, as we've talked about with regard to the Athens effect. Inject to what we have to say and then create some alternative futures in which others can invest because you are part of that future. Thank you. Thank you so, 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 so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, I'm actually enormously pleased with how many themes that you have uh, touched on that we discussed in our preliminary study. Um, and so on. So, so um, one of the temporality was one of the big things that we did, uh, anthropocentrism. And uh, actually, you touched on uh, a session that we're going to have later in the week. Uh, and we're, we're looking at this book by Roman um, Krasnarich, which is The Good Ancestor, which is exactly about the idea of intergenerational duty and uh, empathy and hope. So thank you so, so, so much for that.
Um, so before we kick off the discussion, I'm going to use my speaker's privilege, or chair's privilege to uh, poke you about the things that I'm very interested in. And um, there, there seems to be a tendency in uh, co visual culture to represent um, apocalypse as a beautiful event. So whereas in the past, uh, um, settings were dark skies and dust and, and maybe fires. Right now, everything is, is becoming very, very positive in a sense. So, so when, um, uh, women, uh, when humans withdraw, there seems to be an abounding of nature. So, uh, uh, and, and this happens not only in books, it happens in video games like The Last of Us, it happens in films like Annihilation. Um, so um, um, this is seen uh, by, uh, by Digby, Mark Digby, as um, humans, anxiety around climate change and our inability to control it. Um, does, does this theory uh, sort of um, confirm your research? Um, and if so, why, why, why do you think this happens? Okay, so just to clarify, um, so you're talking about the, what you call the fetishization mm -hmm. of the apocalypse, right? Um, as a way of maybe coming to terms the fact that the apocalypse could be happening and accepting it and saying well actually maybe it won't be so bad or you know let's beautiful let's celebrate it um yes i think that happened it's really interesting in in the history of climate fiction the short history of climate fiction that it tended to happen early on okay um the spectacular apocalyptic events it happened most obviously in a non-literary text, um, a film text, The Day After Tomorrow. Um, and it's wonderful um, CGI effect and so on, which is still quite impressive. Um, and it was a draw. The film was really quite serious. Its science was sometimes a bit dodgy, but it was very serious. The spectacle, the apocalyptic spectacle was such a draw. And um, I think in my research in climate fiction, as far as you can discern trends, okay, and of course there are so many texts that lots of people are doing different things, um, but as far as you can discern trends, after The Day After Tomorrow and then even Kim Stanley Robinson's first trilogy, which had these, each book ended with this really spectacular disaster of, you know, Washington flooded and um, these terrible snowstorms and and, you know, and it, it was also dramatic and it had a kind of appeal, right? Um, or in terms of um, um, uh, spectacle. That's been a change. And I think it has a lot to do with this concern with living with climate change now. Um, and, and those futuristic settings by and large have become much more dystopian, not so um, interested in the aesthetics and beauty of the spectacular apocalypse and much more interested in the uh, sheer hardship of living in a devastated world. Okay, and that's what I'm seeing in climate fiction, but again, you're going to have um, exceptions to the norm. There are different problems with that. It's a different way of coping, right? And there are different problems. I do wonder if just as the spectacular apocalypse may not be very effective because it's just making you say, well, hey, let's just go out with a bang. It's a kind of fatalism attached to it. The dystopia similarly engenders a hopelessness if, it's, um, if it goes too far. And I mentioned Paolo Bacigalupi's um, The um, Wind Up Girl. He's done quite a few novels that are very dystopian, like The Water Knife. And there's actually empirical evidence because people have started studying the effects on readers. There's empirical evidence to suggest that people tune out of those dystopias mm -hmm. if they go too far, as Bajo Galoot said. Thank you. I'll take Lisa and then Ellie. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say like, that was a really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. And I quite like reading climate fiction. So that was a really interesting discussion around it. But I was wondering, like, so one thing that really strikes me about books that talk about climate fiction is quite how like depressing and apocalyptic they are. Because whenever I read them, they make me feel really sad and depressed at the end. Because ultimately, they always paint a narrative of things going wrong and kind of like the failure of governments to take action. And do you 
think perhaps that's a little bit problematic because I see how it's necessary in narrative sense, but it creates an almost hopeless situation where there's not ends that are reached are so and they don't really portray how we as ourselves can actually create a solution right now where we don't end up in a apocalyptic apocalyptic situation. That's a really good question. You may have noticed that I didn't talk too much about utopia versus dystopia, and I didn't um, judge very much if some texts should be doing what they're doing, okay? Though I tried to look ahead to the kinds of things that, that you people of your generation could do with these tools. Um, but I will speculate on that now. Um, I didn't talk about utopian texts apart from Robinson because interestingly, um, just in terms of describing what's going on, as I already, as I said, um, just in the, my last response, I think the trend is for dystopia as you, exactly as you've spotted, right? Um, so there aren't actually that many utopian texts to draw upon. Um, though one, of course, can speculate that it would have a, more, a better effect. I think what's going to happen, I agree with you, there's the risk of hopelessness and detachment. Um, I've got a kind of two-part response, but this is the first part, okay? I think what's going to happen is, um, if it's not too clumsy and oxymoronic a term, a utopian backlash, okay? It is beginning to happen, and a writer like Robinson, who's, who's kept going with his utopian scenarios, and New York 2140 is utopian, actually. It's not dire. It's um, people find a way to reinvent a new economics, okay? There are more and more texts emerging like that, very slowly, and one phenomenon I would like to keep an eye on is what's being called solar punk which I didn't have time to talk about. So rather than steampunk, which is nostalgic really, if you like for the steam engine age and all of that, and it's very gothic, solar punk takes the solar aesthetic as well and imagines crazy new futures around them. Okay? Uh, and interestingly, a lot of solar punk writing is coming from the global south, South America in particular. So you're right, it could change. Um, I think maybe people have too much, but okay, so this is the second part answer and I'd better, I'd better get quickly to the second part. The second part to my answer is, you know, I don't think there's any one right way to write about climate change. I think it's worth exploring several um, ways and several um, um, themes and several emotional responses because everybody's got a different way of responding to climate change and a different story. Um, I think what is the best thing of all about climate fiction being a phenomenon, and I, I'm hopeful about it, is it gives us all different texts and different narratives and different ideas. Some of us want to imagine the worst and then pick ourselves up from that. Some of us want hope and utopia in our stories. Um, you know, um, George Monbiot, the Guardian critic, um, the Guardian writer, trumpeted the road as a climate change text, right? It's not a climate change text by my definition, but I think it's very powerful as an analogy for climate change. He said that's the best global warming novel you're ever gonna read. It's so grim, but he suggested it could have an impact for some people. It certainly did for him. So the second part of my answer is, um, you need more and more people to be coming up with more and more ideas about an emotional response to climate change. It's almost like a big storing house for all of us, going through, working through our, having thought experiments, experiments and healing experiments about climate change as we work our way to ideas and work. Ellie, speak up. No, I'll meet yourself first. No, we can't hear you for some reason. Um, I'll go and take Corinne and then come back to you and see if that's fixed. Just try to uh, meddle with the um, uh, your options. Corinne? Um, hello, hello. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I actually had never heard of climate fiction, surprisingly, before this 
despite my keen interest. So it was very, very informative. Um, as someone who is new to the genre, I know this must be the worst question, but do you have any top recommendations where to start? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I know you, you listed so many books. I just thought, where, where could I begin? Is there, you know, a founding text or something? Or maybe there's a new writer. I'm so sorry for this question. It's a great question. I'm laughing because, um, yes, I do get asked it a lot. It is a good question, though. I mean, no, I, I get asked a slightly different one. I just get asked the, what is your favorite question? And that's a bit, you know, simple. But your question um, is, is a, a, a much more thought out version of that, which is where do you start, right? Um, I have personal favorites for sure. And I think that, you know, there are some that really do um, draw in lots of different approaches and ideas. Um, so I do like Barbara Kingsolver's flight behavior um, because, because it, it makes you think about the present going into the future it makes you think about science and it makes you think about um, non-human species okay but that's a personal favorite of mine it's also i have to note a realist present day text not a not a science fiction text um and there are some texts set in the future that um some people like and i guess i could actually try to recommend um as a as a starting point and i think Claire V. Watkins' Gold Fame Citrus is, is, is one way, one place to start actually, um, because it's, um, you know, it's, it really starts to explore some of those intergenerational issues in very interesting ways. I won't kind of go further into it. I don't want to give you plot spoilers. Um, I also do think The Road is very powerful if you read it with climate change in mind. Um, sorry, just to follow this up briefly, I, I know there are so many people with questions, I just thought um, before I'm put to the bottom of the list again. Um, is there such a thing as like popular climate fiction, as in like, I guess more targeted or like, you know, young adult fiction, but climate fiction? Um, yes, and you know, this is where I confess off the top of my head, because I tend to focus on um, the more kind of serious um, fiction. I can't quite. Oh, um, actually, James Clade, um, who's written James Bradley, who's written Clade. Oh, that's another good one. Actually, Clade is really good. James Bradley, who's written Clade, has been writing a trilogy um, for young adults, and it's great fun. I, I only kind of dipped into the first one, so I can't vouch for all of it. Um, but it's very much empowering um, younger voices, I think, by putting them front and center of the story. So I think I can't quite remember um, what the trilogy is called. I should, it's just as, uh, escaped me now, but the, the author is James Bradley, and he's just written the second installment in what will be a trilogy. There's also a really fun um, young adult novel um, called Carbon Diaries. Um, it's a bit old now, but because I think it's set in the future, but the future's past because I think it's Carbon Diaries 2005 or something, right? Uh, but it's great. It's hilarious. I mean, it's like an Adrian Mole, but climate, to do with climate change. And that's what she set out to write. She wanted to write an Adrian Mole type story. So if you, if you, you know, Adrian Mole is, you know, what your parents would have read and loved you can read some uh, carbon diaries. Uh, so Ellie is still thinking around her, um, her audio. And before we go back to Lisa, uh, can I invite Kier to speak up um, about one of the recommendations that she mentioned in the chat? Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to put out there a book that I found really fascinating to read. It's by Rob Cowan, and it's called Common Ground. And the reason why I find it so interesting is it tracks his journey into becoming a father, into fatherhood, um, as he moves from London back to his northern hometown in England. Um, and while he does that, he spends a lot of time in nature and like the edge land, he calls it. And um, 
while he does that, he starts each chapter from the perspective of an animal. And that's particularly representative of his emotional state at the time. So it tracks that intergenerational um, evolution into fatherhood and I suppose the next generation. And then also the sort of intricacies of the human uh, animal relationship and human as animal relationship. So yeah, I just wanted to put that out there as a recommendation. I put it in the chat just for anyone who wants to look at that, for that gap. So. That sounds brilliant. Thank you. I haven't come across that. I'm, I'm guessing it's non-fiction. It's very much a kind of part memoir, part life writing. Um, that sounds brilliant. I really like that you're talking about a text that, that tries to assume animal voices um, mm -hmm. and, and imagine um, that kind of perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Lisa, go ahead and then we'll go to Ellie. Um, so I think you mentioned how like solar punk was like influence was like tend to be more like in like um, the global south kind of fiction. So do you think there's like a distinction between like cultural distinction between um, texts written about climate change written by um, countries based in different um, cultures? Because obviously like a lot of the text I read is just um, very like Western like English or American authors because it's all English and that seems to take a very apocalyptical approach. But do you think different cultures take different approaches? Because I'm an Anglophone academic, um, I won't pretend to know that much about um, other texts. Um, but um, in my own research, that's where I'd like to go next. Okay. A kind of look really at these transcultural differences. Because yes, I think that could be the case and I'm seeing evidence that that's the case, but I don't want to speak too authoritatively because a lot of my work's been on, I confess, to my disappointment, really quite mainstream Anglophone literature. Okay. Um, and a couple of examples come to mind, three really. One is um, the powerful voices of indigenous writers and someone like Alexis Wright and this one book, um, She's an indigenous Australian writer and she's writing about climate change from the perspective of the dispossession of indigenous Australians historically. And she's comparing that with the dispossession and refugeeism that's affecting everybody now when actually it's a refugeeism that her people have known for centuries, right? That's a very interesting perspective to remind us really. And also then to remind us that perhaps some of the ways of knowing the land and, and looking after the land are, have been with us before. And we need to return to some of these old ways rather than invent new ways. So some of those perspectives come out in, in indigenous writing. And the most obvious one is the Swan Book. Um, another example uh, then is solar punk, like I said, but I. I, I've only just begun to be aware of it and I'd be very interested in looking at what's going on um, from the South American angle. The final example I want to put out there is Afrofuturism, um, which again I can't speak authoritatively on because I haven't been looking at the post-colonial angle for long, um, but there's a lot of good work being on it, done on it and um, it's a kind of it's, it's associated with actually a movement in the last century of um, futuristic science fiction um, with, uh, in film and, in, and, in, and in, 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 in books as well as kind of broadly artistic visual art. Uh, futuristic science fiction um, with, um, um, with Afro-Caribbean, Afro-American or African subjects. Okay, just to kind of have that juxtaposition, I think, of, of what we think of as futuristic and what we think of as primitive. And that's being, there's a lot, you know, there's a, a, a movement that's beginning um, to write futuristic texts with an Afrofuturist angle. Okay, I couldn't give you names now, um, and I'd be happy for you to email me um, 
or happy to find those references for you um, if you wanted to follow them up. But, you know, I, I, I you know, confess my, um, you know, that that's a new thing for me that I want to move into next. So I have to confess my lack of expertise in that specifically. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Let's try Ellie again. Ellie, are you Hello. Ready? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Oh, yes, yes. Um, thank you so much for that lecture. It was super interesting. Um, I actually want to write clarify. It's my next project, like between handing and thesis and Christmas. So, like, what would you recommend doing, like, in terms of actually writing it? And I know obviously every reader is different and you can't generalize what people like want to read but like what kind of themes have you seen that are like really powerful and like what has been like kind of less good and do you think like the plot is more important or like building the world is more important? Okay that's a very that's a rich set of questions here. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I will have to go back to the, you know, not just every reader is different, but every text is different, it's doing different things. A lot of it will depend on, um, generically, you know, where you want to sit. Climate fiction, and you will have noticed I didn't call it a genre, okay, because mm -hmm. it actually, there are lots of different generic elements. Sometimes it's straight out dystopian or apocalyptic, um, sometimes it's romantic. Sometimes it's comic even, you know, so it's not a genre, it's just a category of texts that deal in some way with climate change, okay? So some of it will depend on what you want to do with it. Um, you know, and I think maybe the advice would be, if you want to, you know, let's assume you want to have, to effect some kind of deep, change in terms of your reader's outlook okay that mm -hmm. effort effect um i think you have to begin from the question of what emotional um drivers what emotional effects mm -hmm. as well you want to have in them okay and the genre that you will use to do it you might have preferences now as to what genres you like to write in you might be someone who likes writing science fiction. You might be someone who likes fantasy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that'll give you a start. Yeah. Um, so I think I have to say very broadly, it, it so much depends on generic choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely going to be fantasy. That's as far as I've gotten. Then that's interesting. Then I think, yes, you'd have to think about, I think it is, a, I'm not a, a creative writer, academic myself. Okay. Mm. But, um, I think it's very important, certainly as a literary scholar, I think this way, it's important to think about what you want your reader to feel when they put it down. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get that? What buttons are you going to push? Okay. Uh, my advice would always be don't be too obvious about put pushing buttons, but you know, that again depends on whether you want to go high culture, low culture, right? You know, mm -hmm. fans of highbrow stuff will want it to be very deep and they don't want to know when the buttons are being pushed. Fans of actually fantasy and that's not doing it down. Want, you know, it's, 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 it's recognizable. It's, you know, I want this to happen. I want that to happen. Okay. So if you want that, think about how you're going to push those buttons and get that, that, that effect. That's the best advice I can give, given how broad climate fiction is. Um, mm -hmm. I'd also just from a personal angle, given what I ended on. Um, don't forget um, the, that angle of um, the other species, I think, and, and, and the biosphere, don't forget it. Yeah. Which, you know, given you're talking about fantasy, it could get very interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. don't worry, it will be. Okay, you thank you so much. Out. I've got a little tip, but this is not to do with my expertise. It's got to do with the fact that my stepson enjoys writing fantasy as well. And he's mm. just started watching Neil Gaiman's Masterclass. Um, mm. So have, have a look at that. See what Neil Gaiman has to say, because he's actually written 
I think it was Good Omens with Terry Pratchett um, that actually has some climate change elements to it. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. That was, been, that was just absolutely fantastic, combining the uh, uh, conceptual with the practical, good advice, just an absolutely overall fascinating discussion. So please, everyone, unmute yourself for a round of applause. And uh, so, so, so much for this. Um, and we will come back after the break in 15 minutes time. And thank you very much for being here today. Be thank back. you. Bye. Thank you. I hope you have a really productive conference, all of you. Good luck. Absolutely. And I send you. Good luck with everything. No <laughs> we idea. will send you the report after this. Thank you so much. Really and I'll send you my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Find. Absolutely. Okay. Good <laughs> Thank luck, you. All. Good to meet you. Bye.